dark and stormy place, offering little visibility into how your cloud is performing, how your cloud is managed, how your cloud is secured. The cloud can be a place where customers are forced to follow and not lead. A place where it's all or nothing, where the hows and whens are left to the wizard behind the curtain. But not all clouds were created equal. Clouds have taken on their own shape to serve a specific purpose. Some were built for the consumer market, others built for departmental use. The enterprise IT cloud is different. Built to deliver services, to be used by the entire enterprise, built to automate the mission critical, to operate around the clock and around the world with more transparency, more flexibility, more control. The Enterprise IT Cloud, a cloud where all applications are built on a single platform. Developers work together to deliver innovation at the speed of light and application quality trumps everything else. The Enterprise IT Cloud, a cloud where go live happens in weeks or months, not years. Prototypes quickly become production applications. Citizens are empowered to create new services on the fly, and users are delighted with a new service experience. Customers wave goodbye to the Department of No and celebrate the Department of Now. Implementation is a rallying point for transformation. Services are easily delivered to every department in the enterprise. Productivity soars, adoption skyrockets, and the entire enterprise becomes service-oriented. The Enterprise IT Cloud, a cloud where exceptional service is not optional. Customer instances are monitored and managed individually. Security is constantly challenged and tested. And investing in customer compliance is a top priority. A cloud where redundancy exists at all levels. Software, hardware, network, paired data centers. The Enterprise IT Cloud, a cloud where high availability exists across the globe, powering the service-oriented enterprise in the new age of service. Now. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome ServiceNow Senior Vice President of Engineering and Cloud Operations, Dan McGee. Good morning. All right. Lots of happy faces this morning. Great to see you all. Welcome to the last day of knowledge. Thrilled you're here. How about that party last night? How many went to the party? Wow. What an unbelievable venue. And you know, the weather could not have been more spectacular. A great view of both bridges. Uh, did everybody appreciate the extra hour of sleep we all got uh, this morning? Yes. I know I did. So that video you just saw was actually shot at ServiceNow, not the cows, but all those people you saw, that's actually what it looks like for real uh, back at uh, home base where we, where we invent all this stuff. And uh, they actually do move that fast, right? We give a lot of caffeine to our engineers and uh, that's how we get so much done. So this is the third installment of the trilogy of keynotes that you've been hearing this week. So on Tuesday morning, right, you heard Frank talk about extending the context for where ServiceNow is used throughout the enterprise. Then yesterday, Frank hit, or sorry, Fred hit on continuing to really empower the application creators. It's really a big, important focus for us to continue to do what Fred started with, which was make it really easy to create and deploy applications. What I'm going to talk to you about today is actually operating the cloud, and specifically operating the ServiceNow cloud using ServiceNow. We're really in the unusual position of actually inventing the very thing that we use to run our own business. So we're hoping that we're going to show you some things that maybe you haven't seen before, maybe a few things that will inspire you to try something that maybe you've always wanted to do but you didn't realize you could do with the product. And also for maybe some of the folks out there, we'll answer the question, you know, is ServiceNow's cloud really ready for our business? This is basically what we're going to go through today. We're going to talk a bit about some facts and figures about our size, our scale, where we're deployed, what we got going on. We're going to talk about security. That's clearly on everybody's mind. Availability, I'm going to be a little bit controversial, so I think you'll enjoy that. And then we're going to wrap up the end of it with a really nice demo that uh, also is going to be somewhat unique, and I think that'll be quite fun for you all to see. All right. I'm going to start here, though. If there's one thing everybody remembers from the chat today, it's this. Not all clouds are created equal. 
What do I mean by that? Well, I sort of, sort of got on this slide three flavors of, of software as a service or clouds out there. And let me sort of compare and contrast them a little bit. We're going to start at the bottom with the consumer-based clouds. So what's primarily on the mind of those folks that are really trying to address the consumer segment? What they're really trying to do is get more eyeballs to their property. Right? Their revenue is fundamentally driven on a revenue model. And so they're investing heavily in software features and other kinds of things that will drive and get more of us to try to go to their sites. After all, you know, most all of us are actually using their properties for free. So what goes along with that is things like reliability and availability, not necessarily top of mind. They're not necessarily really bad at that, but their design point is not really at the enterprise level in terms of reliability and availability for their sites. Move it up a notch to the, the departmental clouds. Now these folks, many of them today are trying to extend their applicability into other parts of the enterprise, but they fundamentally started with a very narrow focus. Salesforce on sales, NetSuite on finance, so forth and so on. And as a result, if you look at things like maintenance windows, which we're going to talk about later, these folks actually take their systems down on a very periodic basis to go do maintenance. And that's an okay thing to do for the departmental clouds because on Saturday afternoons, the sales guys are playing golf anyway, right? They're not out there trying to book more deals. So that works for them. Again, it does not work for the enterprise. ServiceNow has a number of customers in the healthcare business where they actually use our product bedside with the patients. It's not going to work for us to take the system down on a weekly basis. I don't care what time of the week it is. So then you get into the enterprise, and this is where I sort of was making the point. The system has to be up. It has to be up basically like the power in the wall has to work. We can't afford to be taking the system down periodically to do maintenance or, or whatever. We have to find other ways to do things. The other thing that really differentiates us from some of the folks on the right side of that slide is, again, ServiceNow is really the only platform up there that is targeted at people that don't necessarily have a software degree, right? trying to make it easy for the common man to actually create applications and get them deployed. So let's get into some of the facts and figures here. We're going to start with, uh, you know, how, what's sort of the extent to uh, our infrastructure today? So we have grown quite rapidly. We have more than 800 engineers and technicians across our organization focused just on developing our product and operating our infrastructure. The data centers are uh, largely on the West Coast. We have a big presence in Seattle, Washington, uh, San Jose, California, down in Silicon Valley, and of course San Diego, where it all got started. And then in Europe, we have a very big presence in both London and Amsterdam. So strong talent in both of those regions. But perhaps more interesting to you is where we have our data centers. And I'm going to show you a slide later on that contrasts us with some of the other folks out there. We have 16 data centers worldwide. These are actually paired data centers in eight regions. And, you know, why did we do that? We didn't necessarily want to create more work for ourselves. Well, it's data sovereignty. Again, the enterprise class customers want to put very sensitive data up in the cloud. And in many cases, that data needs to reside in the region where they exist. So we have paired data centers in Switzerland. We have paid data centers in Australia, obviously paired data centers in the U.S., and so forth and so on. We've made a tremendous investment to put our iron where customers want their data to reside to deal with the data sovereignty topic, which is even bigger right now thanks to uh, the Edward Snowden news. So building out all that infrastructure, and I'm going to show you some statistics on availability later. Getting better at availability doesn't come for free. Just in the last year or two, we've hired 250 people specific to the infrastructure side of our business, and we've spent more than $50 million in getting all this stuff together. Where are we in terms of user count? We're getting close to 12 million users. And some of you folks can do the quick math. Frank announced on Tuesday that we're about 2,100 and change customers, 12 million users. You can see the folks that are using us are really using us at a very large scale. This number is going to come up a little bit later in my presentation, so hang on to it, 12, minute, 12 million users, big number. Instances, right? So instances are basically the things that you guys provision and the things that you, uh, you know, it's sort of our, if we were a hardware manufacturer, this is the widget that we produce. We provision an instance that you all can use. We, uh, we're up to 12,000 instances, and you can see the number of instances that you all are purchasing and that we are deploying is growing at a very rapid clip. Just in Q1 of this year, we actually deployed 975 instances. And in the demo, you're going to see a little bit about how we do this. 
provision an instance at ServiceNow is actually done with ServiceNow orchestration. We have to do it that way because we have those 16 data centers around the world. We have a very involved CMDB that tracks all this stuff. Without automation, there is no way we could accurately and reliably provision that many instances in that short a period of time. But wait, there's more. Just at this show, for all the labs and all the uh, work events that you guys are going through, ServiceNow Orchestration actually provisioned nearly 24,000 instances just over the course of this week, all administered by basically two people. Could have been one person, but somebody had to go home in the middle of the week. So again, a, a, something that we just could not do without ServiceNow Orchestration. All right, more big numbers. So we are provisioning this stuff in our cloud. We are populating our own CMDB. We're up to about 2.5 million CIs, 2.5 million individual entry, entries in our CMDB. Frank showed you on Tuesday, and you will see it again today in our demo, our ability to actually uh, reference a service. So in our case, it's one of your instances, all the way through all the network layers, all the hardware layers, all the way down to the lowest layer of the product. Why is that important? Well, if, if you call us and say, I'm having an issue, something isn't working, we can very quickly go through the tree in CMDB and figure out, hmm, here's where the problem is. And we can go the other direction too. Likewise, if, if we get a low-level alert that say there's some very high CPU utilization on a particular server, we can go the other direction and see all of you that might be enforced. And where the money really meets the road with this is we're able to actually typically notify you and fix an issue before you even see it happen. How about change? Our change process has actually gone through uh, quite a metamorphosis. We didn't really have a very good change process maybe three or four years ago, where today we have an extremely well-articulated change process. We do probably several orders of magnitude more change than many of you out there. Most of the folks I talk to are doing maybe 50 changes a month, 100 changes a month, 250 changes a month, maybe even 500 if it's a really big place. We're doing over 6,000 changes every month. You're going to see this in the demo again as well. What's really driving all this is all of you, right? Every change that you make, every time that you are doing a clone or an update set, that's a change. And we need to make sure that that change goes well and actually doesn't create an outage for you or another kind of problem. Again, you'll see that in the demo. How about incidents handled? So we handle a fair number of incidents. We're almost up to 6,000 incidents per month. Not a number we really want to be big, by the way. But the reason why I'm highlighting it here is this ranges every single inquiry to the company. So when you call about how something should work, all the way up to you have an outage or a serious problem, that's in that number. We have strong support organizations both on the West Coast of the United States in those two European locations I described earlier, and we just went live with an office in Sydney. So we've got round-the-clock capability to handle basically any of your needs. And our uh, customer satisfaction scores that we get for handling incidents are consistently well above nine. So you folks uh, seem pretty happy with what we're doing. But more important to us, and I think more important to you, is we've actually reduced the amount of times you have to call us and deal with us. Over the last year, the average first person that's a customer of ServiceNow had a 32% reduction in the number of difficulties or questions. Uh, and this is a key metric for us within the company. All right, another big number. One more time. There we go. Great. 3.6 billion transactions per month. So a lot of people, when they think about cloud, they think of very sort of storage-centric uh, uh, terms. You think, oh, wow, you're storing lots of bits, lots of pictures, lots of other kinds of things. That's really not what our product is used for. Our product is fundamentally driven on transactions. Folks are making updates to incidents, updates to problems, updates to conference room scheduling like we saw yesterday in the Innovation of the Year Award. Those things are really driving volume. All those users I showed you earlier that are using the system, every single one of those folks are driving transactions. Our skill at actually driving very large transaction rates is what we're good at, scaling our infrastructure to actually be able to achieve that. And 3.6 billion is not the biggest number you hear SaaS providers out there quote. Salesforce has a bigger number that they actually quote. But I think this next slide is going to make it more clear why this matters. When you actually take the average transaction rate per customer and compare us to those other folks, you can see that our customer base is typically 3x the magnitude of anybody else out there. 
And actually delivering on this, there's some fundamental architecture and some fundamental things that we deploy behind the scenes. You don't even know we're doing it. You don't have to buy extra hardware. You don't have to buy extra widgets for us to be able to deliver this. We actually are able to deliver this like nobody else in the industry, and we think it's going to be an enormous competitive advantage. And the way you're going to feel it is you won't feel it at all. It's just going to work for you as you scale. All right, let's talk about security and compliance. Clearly on everybody's mind, you look at the headlines. It's funny, every time we update this slide, something else happens, and we have to add another headline to the slide. And in fact, this week is no exception. AOL got hit this week, if you guys have been paying attention to the news. They had a loss of a lot of their email address, and so now a lot of their customers are getting spammed by other folks out there. So security is clearly on all of our minds. We all worry about what we don't know. And when I hear customers chat about security, frequently they say, you know, we want to keep our most sensitive data ourselves, and we, we're really afraid about putting our, our sensitive data in the cloud. And I want to suggest a slightly different way for people to talk about security. I think what we should be doing is we should be examining what are the policies, what are the postures, what are the compliance track record of the cloud provider, and let's compare that to how we might do it in our own data center. And then let's make a decision about who do we think is really going to be more secure. It's a natural human tendency to want to control those things that are most important. But I think if we actually look at, how, in our case, how ServiceNow does things and then compare that to how we do things, that might lead you to a different answer. And there's a subtle thing in here that I think many people overlook. You all, in terms of running your data centers, are running a quite complex operation. You're hosting hundreds of applications, maybe thousands of applications, maybe for some of the larger companies, 10,000 applications. There might be things you're hosting in your data centers that you're not even aware you're hosting in your data centers. ServiceNow is doing only one thing, and that is hosting the ServiceNow application. We have an extremely homogenous environment. And the way I like to think about it is, you know, we have doors in and out of our data centers, but I think we have a lot fewer doors than many of you do. So. I think we should have a, a stronger dialogue about exactly how does ServiceNow do security and how might that compare to you and then make the decision about where you want to keep your sensitive data. So to help you with that, I'm just going to cover some of the things that we do. Uh, all the time we have conversations with customers in more detail about this kind of stuff, but it starts with development, right? We have product features in the product that you can turn on and off encryption. Uh, at rest, we can encrypt certain fields. There's many things that you can actually add into the product to actually lock it down more tightly than it comes out of the box. In the development process, we're also doing a lot, right? Security is, is so critical for us. It's actually, you know, if we had a big security problem, it would be a real issue for our business, right? It's clearly on everybody's mind. So. Uh, we are doing uh, uh, screening on nightly builds uh, that we do every single day and uh, static code analysis, many other things done on a nightly basis. When we're getting close to doing a release, now we start doing more sophisticated, longer running kinds of tests. So you can see third-party penetration and code inspection is stuff that goes on. Once we release the product and it's now in the data center up and running, we don't, we don't rest, right? We have a group of folks that exist in our network operations center that are constantly watching for what's going on. We're using a security event monitoring with tools like Splunk to actually search for crazy things that might be happening. We're also paying broad attention to what's going on in the world outside ServiceNow so that we can actually uh, get ahead of the game and perhaps defend against something that hits somebody else but hasn't hit us yet. We're constantly monitoring uh, and modifying our perimeter also to trap sort of uh, bad things that might be going on. And then lastly, we don't rely just on ourselves. We have a lot of other people that are helping us out and making sure that we're not missing something. So I'm going to show you another slide in a minute with sort of the alphabet soup of compliance standards that we're a part of and, and we do well with today. They're constantly coming in and recertifying us. And then a number of you actually are doing audits on us in periodic times as well. You come in and, and inspect us. So we're very transparent about what we do here and how we do it, and we're always trying to get better. Security is one of those things that's a war that's never really won, and we really do spend a lot of time on it. On the compliance side, here's sort of the list of the, uh, the compliance standards that we're actually certified on today, save the very last one. FedRAMP is a very new requirement. We are now officially in the in-process state. 
these these uh, certification standards may not mean a lot to everybody in the room, but for your chief security officers or for the folks in your organizations that do worry about these things, these uh, levels of certifications are going to make them feel uh, much more comfortable about what we're doing. So if you have people that are worried about what's ServiceNow doing, show them this slide. This will, this will help a lot. One thing that's going on in the industry that I just want to make everyone sensitive to is, you know, SAS it's not so new anymore, but there's still, these standards have been around for a very long time. So many of these standards are actually sort of modifying their posture from uh, the on-prem environment to what they really mean for the software as a service or the cloud environment. And I think the, uh, the federal standards uh, in particular are things that are changing. So I think this is a good list to, to keep paying attention to, but we are among the leaders in cloud providers with these kinds of standards and where we're at. All right, availability. This is uh, actually going to be a fun topic. So everybody's got a phone at home, right? Many of us still have a wired phone line, I hope. Uh, I don't have that in necessarily uh, in my house, but I got to tell you, whenever the power goes out or whenever you know some other sort of fundamental utility has a problem in my house, I can almost always pick up the phone and I'll have that dial tone. I remember I was in the Bay Area during the Loma, Loma Prieta earthquake a number of years ago, and the phone was the first thing to come back on, and that's probably the same experience you folks have. What ServiceNow is really trying to do, and our standard for you, is to deliver that dial tone level of availability with our cloud service, right? And we control a lot of that, but we don't control all of it. And so there's a lot of things we do to try to mitigate things that we don't control. And you're going to see the results of that in this next slide. This is the measured availability for ServiceNow over the last 18 months. You can see we are now well north of four nines of availability. Okay, what's a nine? So 0.01% is about five minutes of downtime a month, right? So we're better than that. If, you, if you're performing, I'm going to show you another slide in a minute so that these numbers will matter. If you are, if you are experiencing 0.1% of downtime, that's about an hour a month, right? 50 minutes. If you are at 1% downtime per month, now you're talking about eight or nine hours. And you can see, when you're starting to experience that kind of downtime, it's just gonna be a major problem for anybody trying to use the system. So how does that four nines of availability for ServiceNow compare to some of the other folks that you're familiar with that are also providing cloud services? So here's, here's the comparison. Salesforce doing pretty good, Workday not quite as good. NetSuite, pretty good. Amazon, okay. Concur and Jobvite, not even in the same neighborhood. We're going to come back to this line in a minute, so don't get too excited just yet. But you can't just talk about planned uptime. You also need to talk about scheduled maintenance. I, I uh, inferred earlier on that a lot of the departmental clouds take their systems down once a week, right, for whatever reason. It's sort of like rebooting your... Microsoft Windows computer every day because you, you worry about it you know, going blue screen on you or something. These folks you can see are taking their systems down for planned maintenance a significantly long period of time every quarter. Not everybody on that list is not doing so good, but look at ServiceNow. ServiceNow, six hours a quarter. Why is there such a difference? Well, it's not, despite the video, it's not that we work faster than everybody else at repairing things or doing scheduled maintenance. It's we have a fundamentally different architecture. Most of the folks on the right side of the screen are actually running a multi-tenant architecture. What that means is all of the customers are actually sharing a common database. So it's very difficult for them to actually uh, fail over a one customer and operate on that one customer uh, they have to fail over everybody, which is a very scary, scary uh, uh, thing to do. ServiceNow is a single instance architecture. So every one of you is running on an individual instance of ServiceNow. So we routinely will fail you over to the backup side in order to do maintenance on the primary side. And so that six hours is basically made up of the time to do the failover, which is typically a couple of minutes these days. We do it frequently and we're actually quite good at it. And that's gonna come up again in a minute. So when you add that uptime number to the planned maintenance per quarter, now you're starting to get a sense of what the real availability is. We're not all the way to real availability yet. But you can see these numbers now are starting to differentiate themselves a lot more. And if, again, you're in a hospital, you're in a mission critical situation, or even if you're not mission critical, but you know your customers are going to get mad if they can't get into the system, 
these numbers are starting to get very significant. Recovery time. So I talked about failover a minute ago. Recovery time is how long it takes to actually get you back up after an outage, after something broke or something goes wrong. So we target two hours. In reality, I mentioned we're actually doing this in minutes these days, um, most often much, much faster. Uh, the big difference is when we have a problem that we think is going to be resolved by a failover, we will fail you over quickly and very fast. We don't spend time trying to figure out necessarily what was the fundamental thing that broke and try to repair what broke. We will fail you over and then go work on, failing, on figuring out what broke after the fact on our dime, not on your dime, right? Everybody else, because they run this multi-tenant architecture and because if they have a problem with one customer, it's a scary prospect to fail over 200 people at the same time. They don't do failover when you have an outage. They do fix in place. Right? So they're scrambling. If it's a hardware failure, they're scrambling for a new piece of hardware, trying to get things back, put back together, back up before they come back up. And that directly leads to these very long recovery time objectives, or they don't even bother to publish it. I'm not going to cover a recovery point objective this morning, but I did want to go back to data center locations. So that very first slide, I talked about all the places that ServiceNow actually has redundant pairs of data centers. That's what that clever little uh, cloud pair looks like. You can see many of the other folks on this uh, chart do have redundant data centers in the U.S., but only Workday has a redundant data center in Europe, and nobody has redundant data centers anywhere else, right? So there's a reason why Salesforce, for example, doesn't do a lot of business in Europe, and this is exactly why. They don't have a data center there. They're planning on putting one there this year, but I've been saying that for a while, too. Actually, could you go back a slide for me, please? I clicked too soon. Thank you. So back to that top slide, uptime, right? Average uptime. These are the numbers you hear us all talk about. I just did it, right? Beat my chest, big number, four nines, really cool, right? Now I'm going to tell you that number isn't very meaningful. Is this system up? Look at right there. There was a problem displaying your upcoming trips, right? So this, we actually use Concur at ServiceNow to do our travel. Sorry for picking on Concur. But... Concur's uptime is going to register their system is up. Why? The way uptime is actually calculated for every single one of these vendors is they try to ping the instance. If the instance replies, it's up. doesn't say anything about whether it's useful or not. And in this case, it's clearly not useful. So there's nothing more annoying to you, for that matter, me, when we're claiming the systems are up and working fine, but they're not usable and they don't work for you. It kind of defeats the whole purpose of measuring uptime. You're like, who are we trying to make feel better here? So ServiceNow has actually launched just in the last month, and it's on every customer of ours instance today, something you're going to see in a minute. And let me build into it. So this entire space here actually reflects the total uptime. So it's 100% uptime. Nothing has been down. Everything's great. Everything's happy. Okay, one thing that actually can lead to downtime is the thing that's covered by the ping. If you have a hardware failure, you have an in-house network failure, so you can't actually make the ping work, yeah, that's downtime, okay? So that was one category. But there's more. That Concur slide I just showed you, probably a software bug in Concur, maybe a performance issue with the horsepower they've got deployed on that particular instance. I don't know what the problem was, but yeah, I could ping it because it gave me the technical difficulty slide, but I couldn't use it. There was something wrong in their architecture, in their software, in their release, whatever. Took the system down. It was not usable. But you know what? There's things outside the SaaS provider's control, too. There can be third-party issues. So the best example of this is sort of Internet cloud issues, right? Uh, we've seen situations where... Uh, our network is working fine, your network is working fine, but there's somebody else in our neighborhood that's getting perhaps a denial of service attack and there's a tremendous amount of traffic on the line that you use out of your plant that happens to find its way into one of our data centers and that could cause a slow performance issue. Another more uh, less esoteric version of this is Netflix prime time. So it so happens that I, I read a report the other day in uh, the northeast uh, part of, this, of the United States, during prime time hours, Netflix can occupy as much as 25 or 30 percent of the entire network bandwidth out there. Um, so outside the scope of what we're going to chat about today, ServiceNow is actually doing some very interesting things to mitigate those exact issues. 
just general internet clods that have nothing to do with you guys or nothing to do with us, but they fundamentally impact your service. Happy to chat with folks about that after the, after the chat today. And lastly, there are things you guys can do that could actually create problems. A very common one that happens is, you know, we authenticate your users using your LDAP, for example, right? And so when one of your users logs into our system, we're checking back through into your network through your firewall to your authentication machines and validating their credentials, and then we let them in. That's, that's how it works. Well, if some of your networking team actually changes your firewalls around or do things so we can't access your LDAP servers, your customers aren't going to be able to log in. So customer authentication and customer sort of induced problems with authentication is actually not an uncommon occurrence. Also, you got to remember, this is a development tool, right? So, right, we've all written infinite loops in our days, and you can still do that with our product. You can actually invent things that will cause things not to work so well, which is why testing is important. So the point of all this is your real availability is made up of things far more than just that stupid ping, right? So what are we doing about it? Well, we're talking about it here, and now we've introduced, this was asked for last year, a real availability dashboard. So on every customer's homepage today, you can go here and you're going to see all of your instances. So in this case, this particular customer has two production instances. Those are the ones that have high availability assigned to them, and three non-production instances. Every little chiclet, every little dot across the screen represents a day. There's 90 days worth of history here. If it's green, you had no issue. If it's yellow or red, you had an issue, okay? If you hover over that, it'll actually show you the incident number, and it will show you the length and duration of that particular outage. You click on that, it'll open up the incident. You can read what the cause was. And the important thing here is we're not trying to worry about who was at fault. We're just trying to reflect your experience, not our spin, your experience on what your real availability is. And that number in the upper right-hand corner, then that is going to be your computed availability. And that ought to resonate with how you feel the service is working for you. Okay? Again, every customer has this working for them today. Go take a look at it. And we're going to demo this in a second. In fact, we're going to demo it right now. So I'm going to ask a, a couple of uh, buddies of mine to come up on stage. If we could advance the slide one slide. There we go. Fantastic. So I got Pat Casey coming up here on my right and Alan Line One coming up here on my left. Yay. So what we're going to do, we're going to go through a very specific scenario. It's sort of an eight-step uh, uh, demo for you here. And I was joking with him earlier. You know, of course, we rehearsed these things. I told him we were going to do it backwards today <laughs> just to really confuse him. Now, we're going to go forwards. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to show this demo from two perspectives, right? Alan is going to show you and represent the ServiceNow perspective. This is what he, ServiceNow sees while we're going through this stuff. And then Pat is going to actually represent your perspective, the customer perspective. So you're going to be able to see how this all works. We're going to go through these eight steps. I'm going to go through them real quickly right now, and then I'll, as we go to, into each one, I'll introduce it a little bit more completely. So the first thing we're going to do is provision a new instance. The scenario, the broad big picture scenario is Pat is already a ServiceNow customer. He's already got that customer availability dashboard, but he's been asked to go generate a new application, all right? So one of the things Pat's going to, the first thing he's going to do, he's going to ask for a new instance. Why is he going to ask for a new instance? Well, he doesn't want to do development on the production instance, right? So he wants a fresh instance where he's going to go be able to play and wreak havoc without causing any sort of production problems. Then we're going to request a clone. We'll talk about that when we get there. Creating the application, that one's pretty self-explanatory. That'll be step three. Step four is going to be promoting that application into production, right? He's done with it. Now he wants to publish it and get it out there. Then we're going to go into sort of the steady state stuff. We're going to show you how we're monitoring it, both from your perspective, what you can do to monitor, and we're going to show you what we're up to. Then we're going to inject a problem. We're going to have an outage. That's the trouble in paradise section. Step seven, we're going to review, now that we've completed that outage, what that dashboard I just showed you looks like, because it's, it's updated in real time, so it will show you what that looks like based on the outage we just had. And then lastly, Fred introduced Share yesterday. We're actually going to show us... Uh, promoting this thing to share and show you how easy that is. All right. So we're going to go now to step one. So just to remind you again, Pat's now, he needs to provision a new instance so he can start doing his development. So we're going to switch it over to Pat. We're going to flip-flop back and forth, so hang with us as we go through this. And off to Pat. He's going to introduce his company. All right. 
Thank you very much, Dan. I do want to spend a couple minutes talking about our corporate entity and the kind of challenges we're facing and what we're actually working on. Uh, we're Acme Incorporated. We're actually not that well-known a brand. I wanted to share a couple of our products here for you in case you missed it. You know, if you have an Acme brand, Anvil, we are in fact that Acme. Rubber bands, that's also us, especially the giant kinds. We're especially proud of explosive tennis balls. That was a huge seller in the 1990s. That was actually a joint venture between our sporting goods and uh, home defense divisions. There was that unfortunate incident at Wimbledon and then the congressional investigation, but they were so well for a while. And our rocketry division also something we were very proud of, at least temporarily. Uh, all that said, uh, the challenges for the company these days are we've actually seen a decline in sales. Things have been a little tough. There's the great Roadrunner Coyote Peace Treaty. A lot of our sales in the southwest have declined. So the board has actually kind of been on a retreat for about, you know, about 17 years, actually, in Napa. Um, <laughs> And they've been working really hard on a new business venture, something radically different to take us into the 21st century. And, and they really think at this point that they've picked out exactly the right business opportunity for us to go into. And they've asked the IT department to take a key part in that. We have to write a new application to support this. So with all that said, I actually need to get ready and get a new application instance ready. So I'll turn, turn over to Dan for a second just to kind of talk about how that's going to happen. Great. Thanks, Pat. So, you know, the story gets better every time he tells it. <laughs> really good. Uh, all right, so normally what happens when an instance gets provisioned, if you're, if you're a current customer, is there's a sales transaction that takes place. We're, you know, we didn't want to let any sales guys up on the stage, so we're just going to imagine that happened. Alan's now going to say, I've got the order for a new instance, and he's going to show you actually a little bit behind the scenes of how that happens and gets provisioned. So, Alan? Thanks, Dan. Yeah, so I just received the order uh, from our sales ops team, and we're going to go provision a new instance with inside ServiceNow. It might not surprise you too much to learn we use ServiceNow Service Catalog to do that. So here's the service catalog that we actually use internally. You can see there's a bunch of things around here for us, people that like three-letter acronyms like DNS and DHCP, I guess that's four letters, and other things that we actually do inside of our infrastructure. But you'll see that right here we actually can provision a new instance. So I'm going to go into that screen. This is the actual screen we use when we provision up an instance. I know that uh, Pat's a pretty demanding guy, so I better get his development instance up and going, because Lord knows Roadrunners need that. Um, we're going to have uh, a change control, because we go through change control properly within our infrastructure for all those changes that Dan mentioned earlier. You'll see there's a couple things we need to quantify here in terms of whether this is going to be a production or a subprod. It's going to be a subprod for Pat. Uh, I know that these guys are really big in the American Southwest, so I'm going to provision that to be in our U.S. pair of, of data centers and make sure that gets provisioned in the proper location. And with all that said and done, just like shopping online, I'm going to order now. And what this does is this begins an orchestration and workflow similar to what you've seen before within ServiceNow. And you can see that that orchestration and workflow is provisioning through multiple steps. And, you know, booting up an instance and sort of finding the right things takes a little bit of time. So I'm going to go in and actually show you what's going on behind the scenes a bit. And go in and look at the workflow and actually scroll down here and get the graphical view of this workflow to see what's, what's actually happening. And this is literally the workflow that goes on. And it's what's executing right now. So you'll see that we do things like we pre-provision and pre-validate that we have capacity. You'll see that if it's a federal customer, I heard Pat mention something about government and exploding tennis balls, so there might be some FISMA approvals we have to go through. We make sure we have capacity for storage. We make sure that we set up the databases. We zboot the instance. We add the JVMs and the nodes. All the stuff behind the curtain that actually occurs. We make sure that we're provisioning any plugins they may have bought. We do a little bit of post-provisioning validation. And then we kind of reach the end of the workflow. And at that point, the instance is up and ready to go and ready for our customers to use it. So with this in mind and taking a look at this workflow, Dan, it looks like things are moving along pretty, pretty nicely. So I'll hand it back to you for the next step. Awesome. Thanks, Alan. So that is exactly how we're able to provision across this very complicated infrastructure and populate our CMDB so that later on when we have issues, we know what's related to what and we can actually figure out what's going on. We couldn't do it without our orchestration product. All right, we're going to move to step two now. So we're in, we have two forms of copying instances in the product today. We're going to talk about them both today. First one is cloning. Cloning is exactly what it sounds like. We actually completely replicate one instance onto another. Why do we want to do that now? Well, the reason why is if Pat's going to go develop a new application, right now it's just a fresh blank slate. It's you know right out of the box. It doesn't have any of uh, Pat's current uh, production personality in it. 
So we're going to clone the production instance as it exists at Acme Incorporated onto that development instance before Pat starts doing development. That's going to make sure that whatever he's developing in actually mimics the environment he's eventually going to be uh, promoting this thing to. So let's go over to Pat and see how he does that, how that happens. All right, thanks a lot. So it's probably not surprising the way I clone ServiceNow instances is from within my ServiceNow instance. So I'm here in my production instance. You can kind of tell because it says production up on top. So we'll actually start with the request clone button here. A lot of you have probably used this. This is nothing special about this. There's nothing uh, unusual about the Acme instance. I'm going to choose I want to clone onto my freshly provisioned K14 Acme dev. It's a little bit of a tongue twister, but we wanted to keep it straight. So we figured we could remember that one. And I'm actually going to specify that I want this clone to happen next month. The last thing I want is for the clone to actually kick off right here, right now during the demo, because that could add a bit of a challenge. I'll add my uh, well-understood email address here, and then I hit submit. What the system's actually going to do behind the scenes is do some quick validations to make sure I'm actually allowed to do the clone uh, that I wanted to. It's going to make sure I'm actually an administrator on both systems. It's going to make sure I actually own both systems. You know, the last thing you as a customer want is for some other customer potentially to make a typo and clone on top of your instance. So it's actually going through all of this validation now. It's finished the validation. It says, hey, look, are you really sure you want to do this? Because the target's going to get overwritten. Yes, I am. I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. And then, as far as I know, my work here is done. But I think there's some work that ServiceNow is actually going to do on the back end to make sure that this clone actually happens. Great. So remember I said we do over 6,000, like 6,600 changes per month. A full third of those are exactly these clone requests. So we want them all to be automated, but there's some checks and balances we actually do before it actually continues with that automated process. Because again, cloning can be a very dangerous thing, right? You're physically copying one instance onto another. So we do some additional things to make sure that that request is not a questionable request. If it is, we'll actually pick up the phone and call you before we let it happen. We're going to go over here to Alan, and he's going to show you sort of the behind the scenes side of that. Yeah, so send in the clones, I guess. Um, what we did in this particular environment is we didn't want the automation and the cloning to go ahead automatically. It might actually provision while we were standing here, as Pat said. So you'll see we have the clone request here. We've manually set it to pend pending approval. We actually have a bunch of things we go through before we actually allow the clone to go forward. We don't want to clone over production. That would be a bad thing. We don't want to, we want to make sure the clone is happening in the right geography. I don't want to clone from the U.S. over to Switzerland or Australia over to a different region. We need to check on compliance issues. We need to make sure there's no legal restrictions for doing the clone. There's a number of things we have to do. So let me just take a quick glance at everything that's going along here and make sure that everything is, is provisioning and look like it's, it's, it's proper. And it does, Dan. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually move that to the approved state. And as you see, I move it to the approved state and update it in the system. The clone is now provisioning along and Pat should have something to develop on. Awesome. So this is a perfect example of using ServiceNow to remove the human being from the request fulfillment process. Pat requested a clone, and it's the automation that in 90% of the cases is going to fulfill that clone. If we didn't have this process in place, we would have 2,200 and some more things to do <laughs> every month for a human being, and they would screw up a certain percentage of those, right, because we humans make mistakes. So cloning and our ability to actually automate it with ServiceNow is something you can do. It's a great thing. All right. Now we're going to move on to creating the application. Fred talked a fair amount about this yesterday. Pat's going to now uh, introduce his application and show you a little bit about it. Uh, sure. So one of the interesting things about writing an application is that it's actually really, really boring to watch. So we struggled to find something interesting for you to look at while I did this, and we decided we couldn't. So while I actually write my application, Dan's going to talk a little about what's happening in the back end, and then we'll kind of cut back in a few minutes, and then I'll show you what I've got. Yeah, so just a couple of quick points about application creation. So everything that Pat's doing, all the development is actually done from his web browser. There's no client application that is required on his machine, doesn't, even, doesn't exist on his machine, other than the browser itself, which means he can do this from any computer anywhere, and he can log in and get you know, the work that he did last night on a different computer. Likewise, all of his teammates can actually co-develop with Pat on their computers using their web browsers. The other benefit of this is sort of the behind the scenes piece. All the artifacts that Pat's using to create his application, his forms, his lists, 
his workflows, any content that he's creating, all of those things are stored within the database themselves. And by storing everything within the database, it allows us to make backup easy. It allows us to do the replication for the production instances. It allows us to do everything we need in a very simple way to take care of your instance. So all you have to do is focus on creating the application. We take care of everything else for you in the background. All right, let's go back and check with Pat and see how he's doing on this app. Thanks. And actually, this platform is so powerful, and I am that good that I just wrote the whole application while he talked. Okay, maybe not. Uh, we did do some of it beforehand, but I turned it on. Um, so at this point, I'll kind of tell you what we actually wrote in this case. And we really do think this is the new um, application for the future. Our new business venture, Acme Incorporated, we're going into llama farming. We really think that that is the great uh, future of a 21st century industry. And I'll kind of talk you through what we've done here. You know, if you're going to farm llamas, you do need to track you know, your farms. This is one of our test farms. It's in Oregon. It's about 300 acres, and it's got, it's got three llamas. It will be more llamas. They're sort of like rabbits. You start with three, and you, you get more over time. That's kind of the point of the farming. Um, we're actually targeting 2,100 llamas here. Uh, we also have some of our test llamas. Uh, we can look at Frodo, the test llama here, for example. Um, he was... <laughs> He, he was pretty happy uh, to see us. We, I think he was happy. Either that or he wanted to bite me, but we'll move on. Um, and he's actually got a mother and a father. Uh, we have the Llamapedia. You know, one of the things we discovered when we started talking about this internally was that llamas are kind of, you know, misunderstood animals. They're not well understood even inside Acme. And since it's a new line of business, we wanted to kind of talk more about them. So you can get some things about the characteristics of llamas here. Uh, we can learn a bit more about their nutrition. Uh, new, llamas are actually very picky eaters. I think they're not like panda picky, but they're still reasonably picky. It's a bit of a challenge for us. Uh, worth pointing out as well, though, that this application is not just about the production of llamas. This is also an end user portal where you can buy llama-related products from us. So we actually have a llama service catalog we produced here. We have the llama catalog. Um, talk about some of the things that you can actually do uh, with our llamas. Um, First of all, you get a llama flotation device. Uh, talk a little, one of the things we discovered when we were working on the farms is llamas are buoyant. And so naturally we thought there was an opportunity in the aviation division. So we did a joint venture with Boeing and we were gonna fold llamas up and kind of put them under the seats in lieu of those little yellow you know, seat cushions. Because if you're gonna go into a water landing, wouldn't you rather have a llama with you? I mean, they're warm, they're comforting, they, they're soothing animals. We did have some challenges though, to be honest. Um, you know, for one thing, llamas fold up small, um, but it, it, it's coach. I mean, there just isn't space. We, we tried. It just couldn't be done. We did have one engineer who had a really good idea. He wanted to puree the llamas, um, but the ASPCA kind of got in our case about that one. So we have an inflatable float instead. Um, you're welcome to get one from us, though. These are actually available. And I'll also point out, you know, the llama pack train. You can get this from us. Uh, delivered anywhere with a rail depot in the United States in 48 hours. You can get as many llamas as you want. Um, we will provide thousands of them if you're so inclined. We'll provide TAC, and we'll deliver them, as I said, on a 48-hour notice. So with all that said, we're really excited about this application. It's ready to go. It's passed internal QA. We haven't actually deployed it yet. So I'll pass it a little bit to Dan to talk about that process. Hey, you know what? I woke up this morning, and I looked a lot like that picture of Frodo the llama. Mm. Uh, makeup helped a lot. <laughs> all right, so Pat's now got this, this application still sits in his development instance. It's all working. He's ready. It's all signed off on. And now he wants to deploy it to his company. He wants to get it on to that production instance. So now we're actually going to talk about the other form of copy. So we don't want to do a clone in this direction. Why? Well, we'll begin to write over everything in the production instance that's changed since Pat started doing development. That would be a bad thing. So this is where we use a technique called applying an update set where Pat's actually able to select just the artifacts that he's modified that actually mean and make, uh, make up his llama farming application and move those, just those artifacts uh, actually into the production instance. So again, this can all be done from, from the instance itself. Pat's going to show you how that works. Great. So those of you who've used older versions of our system are probably familiar with the lovely update set UI. Uh, those of you who've worked with Calgary or Dublin have probably seen the new team development feature. Behind the scenes, it's a very similar mechanism, but it does give you a much more natural UI if you're used to working with a more traditional source control system. Here you see I've got my local changes. I've got the world of Llama, and I want to push it to production. Pretty straightforward. I go ahead and I queue it for push, and then you can probably guess I push the button marked push. So I'm going to push that one. I got to name this Deploy the Llamas. 
or unleash the herd. I don't want to type that quickly. We'll go ahead and push changes. What this is actually doing as I'm talking is it's actually taking the change into my development instance and pushing that to production. For those of you who've done, for lack of a better word, a real one, you probably realize that it takes more than about five seconds. I'll let you in on a very well-kept secret. I actually pushed the app to prod earlier. This is just the application menu, but it should be there now. So I'll pass it back to Dan to talk about some of the next steps. Great. Okay, so now it's all up in production. Now we're going to go to sort of step five, which is monitoring. Pat's actually able to uh, monitor a lot of the performance of his particular uh, instance directly, again, from the instance itself. So why don't we switch back to Pat real quickly before we go to Alan, and we're going to show you some of the graphs that Pat's actually able to take a look at uh, in terms of monitoring the activity on his instance. Thanks a lot. So these are my instance activity graphs, which I can pull up anytime it's my ServiceNow instance. I can get a trend based on different time as to how things have been going in my instance. In this particular one, you can see that the activity on this app has been fairly low. In fact, I've had all of zero users until relatively recently when we've actually had up to four people on this system. I think that might have something to do with the fact they'd actually announced the application is live yet, so we're really looking forward to the users getting on. But that announcement will go out tomorrow morning, and we're all waiting with bated breath. And in the meantime, Dan can talk about what ServiceNow is going to do to support us while that happens. Great. So the point of this demonstration from Pat is there's a wealth of information about how your instances are being used in the instance itself. So your admins have the ability to go in and look at all this data. But let's go check in with Alan because obviously ServiceNow needs to monitor all 12,000 of those instances I told you about earlier. And that's not a trivial thing to do. So he's going to show you a little bit about how ServiceNow is monitoring things uh, uh, back at the, at the NOC. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, we're monitoring llamas, all sorts of farm animals back there. Uh, we spent all of our time looking at all the 12,000 instances that you all are running across our infrastructure, and we spent a lot of time doing this. This is actually an application we wrote in ServiceNow called the Alert Console. And the Alert Console is what our site reliability engineers are looking at 24 by 7 by 365 in our NOx in San Diego and London. So we always have eyes on these monitors. We're looking for, for a lot of different things. We're looking for monitoring servers and storage. We're applying software patches. We're looking for networking issues. We're looking for all sorts of things that might actually affect the availability, because as Dan said, that's really, really important to us. We know the cloud needs to be available, and we need to understand the status of, of everything that you have all deployed on the infrastructure. So you'll see we have a, a category of critical alerts, and thankfully, since I'm up here on stage, we don't have any at the moment. Uh, you'll see we have alerts about your specific types of instances for those of you, if you notice your uh, CI name in here, no instances have been hurt in the making of this demo, unlike perhaps some llamas. And you'll see that there's some performance issues. We have a CPU problem that came in this morning, and a couple other things. We're looking at backups that might have failed that need to be rerun. Looks like we got a chassis that's got a voltage problem, a little bit of system temperature stuff. We're, we're doing thousands of these checks every minute across the entire infrastructure against all the different data centers, all 16 of them. And we want to make sure that, that everything's doing the right thing. And, you know, Dan, it looks like all the llamas are flying through the cloud just fine right now. So I'll hand it back to you. Awesome. All right. So you just heard it. Alan just said everything's working fine, right? <laughs> so what always happens after somebody says that, right? So we're now going to simulate an outage. So something's gone wrong. And we're going to show you what that experience is for both us, how we use our tool to sort of figure out and fix. And we're also going to show you what it's going to look like from your side. So, Alan? Yeah, right back in the hot seat. So you'll see that the alert console has changed a little bit now. And this is actually what happens when something goes bump in the night for us. We get these alerts. We call them fire alerts. And you'll see that I have a fire alert here showing that a database server is unavailable. And I have a bunch of instances unavailable. One of them, unfortunately, is Pat's. And since he's right there, um, I probably need to pay attention to this a little bit. You know, if we also open up an incident for the fact that this database server is down, I noticed just from the DNS name that this is on our Virginia data center. So we've already got techs on our way to Virginia to take a look at this particular machine to see what's going on with this database server. We've also starting to update the incident to sort of give some information back to the customers that potentially are affected here. And, you know, Dan, I'd love to chat a little bit more, but give me a sec, okay? Great. So what Alan's doing basically is telling me to get lost. He's got work to do. And that's exactly <laughs> what really happens. When there's an issue or an outage that's serious, we go into two very definitive workflows. The first one is 
the uh, folks trying to figure out what happened, right? And their focus is fundamentally trying to get you back up, the service restored as fast as we possibly can. And as I showed you a little bit earlier on in our statistics slides, we're actually doing that in minutes pretty good these days. But the other thing we need to do is kind of keep everybody informed. So there's another track called the communication track which gets launched. And what do we use for that, right? We use incidents. So I get an email when there's an outage. Frank gets an email. Fred gets an outage. And you, the customer, is also going to get an email trying to explain what's going on and keeping you informed. So we're going to go check in with Pat and see what that experience looks like from the customer side. Pat? All right, thanks. Or I guess maybe not so much thanks, but I'd rather know than not know. So actually, I wasn't at my desk when this happened. I was actually at lunch at Naturally. And I, so I didn't have access to a browser, but I did have my phone. So I got an email from ServiceNow, and the first thing I did was I take out my phone, and I went to the high system. And I can pop over and look, and you know, lo and behold, I do in fact have an instance, instance, incident, excuse me, that my instance is unavailable. And it looks like it's an active outage that's going on right now. I actually need to start calling some of my customers about this, because they're going to start calling me relatively quickly. I want to get ahead of that game. So while I call my customers, why don't I talk to Dan a little bit about what ServiceNow is doing to get my Great. system back up. So we're going to now go check in with Alan. So You've been informed, you, you know, we still haven't figured out what's going on, but you know it's something's going on. We're going to now check in with Alan and see how is he figuring out what the problem is, and more importantly, how is he going to restore service quickly? Alan? Yeah, thanks, Dan. So I've been talking to the guys over in the Virginia Data Center, and it looks like that, you know, it looks like we have a RAID controller. So basically we have a RAID controller failure on this database, and I'm really suspicious because I see that I have a database failed, and I have all these instances failed at roughly the same time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the power of our CMDB, and I'm going to dig in a bit to this particular configuration item. When I can dig into this particular configuration item, you'll see we have the impact view. And the impact view shows the impact of this particular database in the services that are then affected and the customers that are then affected. You'll sort of see it, it jiggles around a little bit. And you'll see right over here, as I zoom in, I see that Pat's K14 Acme instance is actually red. Acme as a company is up because his, his development instance is probably up, but his production instance is down. And this, this view gives me a real good feeling of that this is the database that actually is affecting these customers. And because of that, I need, to, I need to check a few more things here to look at what's actually going on. But I really think what we want to be able to do now is we want to fail them over, use those pair data centers and fail off this database and move those instances onto the data center pair. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and invoke the failover button using ServiceNow workflow and orch orchestration. I'm going to watch this impact view as this failover occurs. And while this is going on, Dan, why don't I turn it back to you, and I'm just going to make sure the failover works right. Great. So that's really that simple in terms of how a failover occurs in these emergency situations. There are certain checks and balances we do, but not nearly as many as we do for a planned maintenance kind of activity. And if we watch this long enough, you'd see those uh, red circles begin to turn green again. But the other thing we can do is just check back with Pat and see how's the instance look? Is it actually working and back up for him? Pat? Great. So actually, I can tell from my phone, which I've kind of been, honestly, I've been clicking it like a rabid badger. But it, it stopped. At, I can see now. We actually, ServiceNow has told me the update has happened. I can see on my instance history that Alan told me there was an outage. He told me the instance was down. About nine minutes later, he indicated there was a failover in progress, but didn't give me an ETA. And then about four minutes after that, it says the failover actually completed. Let me pop back to my instance very quickly here. <coughs> Wrong one. Wrong one. This is why I'm not a professional demo person. It does look like it's up again. Let me see if I can see some llamas. Yeah, I think we're looking good. I have my llama farming back. So I need to start calling some of my customers let them know the system's back up and available. And while I do that, Dan will talk a little about some options I have. Great. So it's usually that simple, right? Failover, it's usually that simple. Uh, diagnosing issues. Sometimes if we think the issue is a network issue at your facility, we need to get on the phone with your network and team. Things can take a little bit longer. But it really, uh, it really goes well uh, the vast majority of the time. All right, so now we just had an outage. Let's go back and review that customer dashboard that shows what your real availability is and how that event we just had is reflected on that dashboard. Let's check back with Pat. Thanks. So I've had a few minutes to kind of relax. I've talked to my customers. The instance is back up. I actually finished my lunch. But I do kind of want to pop over to my availability dashboard here and get a look at what's been going on. I've actually had kind of 90 days or 89 days of perfect availability here. But I do see that, you know, today I do have an outage against my instance. It lasted about 13 minutes, which is actually pretty good. I wasn't sure if it was, you know, 10 or 17. It probably felt like a lot longer for me. But it's good to have these exact ups and down times. If I wanted to drill through directly in there, I could. 
I can also see that over here on the open issues side of the house, I do actually have that incident. It is still open. I assume in service now is still working on a root cause for me. Um, but I'm back up at this point, and I've got visibility into what happened. So I'm in a pretty good state right now. Great. So just to sort of hit the hammer one more time on that, this is going to reflect your experience with the instance. So if you open a P1 for whatever reason, it's going to show up on this graph, and it's going to affect that availability calculation. Okay, so now everything's back up and running. Uh, Pat's actually got a lot of internal activity, but he's been sort of out there sh showing this to his colleagues in the industry, and he's getting a lot of requests for other people that want to build a llama farming app just like the one Pat did. Well, now we have the share website to be able to do that. So we're going to start with Pat, and he's going to show you how easy it is to actually take that application and upload it to share. Once Pat's done that, we're going to get a little bit of a more complete tour from Alan. So let's start with Pat. All right. So here I am logged into Share. I'm logged in as me, probably not too surprisingly. I'm going to go ahead and upload some new content. And I'm just going to do that by clicking Upload New. And the first thing I'm going to do is I've got to categorize my content. Uh, there actually isn't one for farming per se, but I think custom apps is a pretty good general case assumption here. So we're going to call this the world of llama, the best damn llama farming app ever, on this platform at least. And we're going to go ahead and say everyone can see it. All I got to do now is actually have to add the artifacts here, so we actually have someone to upload. I actually unloaded this previously, so let's go ahead and grab the llama file. If I had some documentation, I could include that in the supporting files section here. I got to tell you, though, llama farming is such an obvious activity. We really felt documentation was really unnecessary in this case. And also point out that the share portal is usable by anybody in any version of ServiceNow, but the applications we put up there may have a version dependency. This one actually requires Calgary or Dublin. And I'm going to go ahead and push the Share Now button. I'm actually not going to do this now because I did this backstage just to make it easier for you. It's worth pointing out that if you go to Share right now, you can actually download your very own llama farming application. It's available. And I have a bet going backstage. I actually want to see if I can get the top downloads for the next week. So please help me out on this one. Mm -hmm. um, with that said, why don't uh, Dan pass back over, and yeah. you can talk a little more is about there, Share. Is there a warranty with that application? Uh, caveat mTOR. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Great. So let's go check over with Alan. He's going to give you a bit more of a full demo now of Share, and uh, you'll see what it's all about. Alan? Yeah. Pat, you're going to lose that bet. <laughs> so yeah, I want to spend a little bit more time talking to you about Share. Uh, this is a sharing portal that we've put out. We're very, very proud of this sharing portal. You know, one of the things we heard at K13 last year is that people wanted to have a community of extensions and have a community of ideas being shared. We wanted to extend sort of the great energy and excitement around the platform beyond just the knowledge events throughout the entire year. So we really built ServiceNow Share to make sure that this content could survive and thrive through the entire year. You'll see when you come to the app, you'll actually see that there's a, a search box you see you can find top downloaded uh, content here. Don't see World of Llamas there yet, Pat. You're going to see uh, highest rated content and top contributing partners. And again, it probably won't surprise you that ServiceNow Share is written on top of ServiceNow. So this is an application we wrote on our own platform. You can go in and look at various categories of things, application extensions, custom applications, dashboards, integrations, scripts, etc. But you know, I'm going to go in and look at one particular application, uh, if I could type. Harder than it looks. And there's an exam manager application that was written. And this gives you a sort of a flavor of everything that's available on Share. You get a description of the application. You can see what versions it's available on. You, as a user, can rate the application. You get comments from various developers and users and what's going on. You can subscribe to the application to actually get updates when new content is updated. And because what you're actually doing is downloading an update set to your local machine and then importing that update set onto your instance, people generally want to know what's going on. So you can go into particular client scripts, and you can actually look at the actual script that's actually going to be uploaded and sent to your instance when you do the import. And you know, we really think that this is a powerful tool, a powerful community building site. And we think that it's going to be extensible and used for, for a long time coming. Matter of fact, we're, we're looking forward to seeing a lot of submissions from those of you here in the hall, and including the folks we saw in the hackathon on Tuesday. Great. Good transition. So. This was just one scenario of how we actually use our product at our company. 
uh, obviously we're just sort of scratching the surface. We'll extend the offer for anybody to come in and, and visit with us and ask us more questions about these particular applications and maybe you'll see some other things we're doing that are kind of exciting too. Like I said, much of what we do here does find its way into our product uh, in, in upcoming releases. So coming up next is actually the Hackathon Awards. Alan went with a lot of uh, crazy folks were up really late Tuesday and uh, they did some really cool stuff. So Alan's going to walk us through the Hackathon Awards and then I'm going to step back up and do a couple more things before we're done today. Alan? Thanks, Dan. So yeah, Tuesday night, that was a long, uh, fun event. We actually had about 25 teams of people creating custom applications on the platform. We gave them from about 3.30 in the afternoon to about midnight to create them. And then at midnight we judged them and called them down to the top five. The top five then got to display their applications at the expo floor yesterday. And you all voted using SMS and American Idol to figure out who won the hackathon for us. We had things from Major League Baseball fantasy teams to conference room scheduling to somebody working on stuff for the World Cup. But I do want to do one quick honorable mention. There was a gentleman uh, who showed up at the hackathon named Rick Acosta. Rich Acosta. Rich had never touched ServiceNow, showed up at the hackathon the day he first touched our platform, and wrote a Hootsuite-like sentiment analysis for social networking in one day. Major props for doing that. We really thought that was awesome. <laughs> but without any further ado, let me tell you about who our finalists were. Here we go. Our five finalists. We had a team that built an application for doing cable car management within San Francisco, kind of the San Francisco treat. We had a team that actually built a hub for schools and communities between teachers and students. We had a team that was actually building something to manage your social networking and social programs called Social Loop. We had a team that took me back to the 80s. You guys remember the adventure chat game? You're in a long, dark hallway, many twists and turns. They did that in our chat application. That was really, really cool. And we had a team that made password management. It was a really creative set of uh, applications. I hope everyone had a lot of fun at the hackathon, and I hope we see a lot of you at the hackathon next year. But moment of truth, who actually won our hackathon? I know you're all sitting here with your stomachs in your throats, so I'll tell you. Winner of 2015, sorry, 2014 hackathon <laughs> is the School Hub. <laughs> These folks created an amazing application for us, help education, help schools communicate, video classrooms, video learning. It was just an amazing app that they created. So we're going to congratulate them, have a little show and tell later on. Hope you go to the Share site and see all the hackathon creations that are up on Share. But with that, I'm going to turn it back to Dan. Great. Just one last thing before we go today. So there's a full day of activities still planned. So the show's not over. There's labs. There's other kinds of breakout sessions. So check your schedules and see that there isn't something that you're dying to go do and, and take advantage of today before you blast off. But let's look forward to next year. So start putting it on your calendars. Knowledge 15 is going to be back in Las Vegas at the Mandalay Bay, April 19th to the 23rd. So let's get that on your calendars. It's going to be even bigger and better than this year. And with that, as you're leaving today, we've got some film here for you to all watch. It's a little bit like the, uh, the outtakes uh, or not, but you'll be able to maybe look for yourself and uh, see some, uh, some of yourselves in this video of everything that happened this week. It was a great time. Really happy you're here. Looking forward to seeing you next year at 2015.